This is Jeffrey Milburn, and this is the Omni Art Salon number 286. It is a great conversation I had recently with author and teacher Marge Klemp about how to perceive the hidden meaning behind life events and how the spiritual masters of the ages have influenced human evolution in surprising ways. An avid researcher and historian, Marge reveals how spiritual masters through the ages have deeply influenced human history and brought change and spiritual freedom about for many who have never even heard of their existence. Marge talks about individuals as disparate as Winston Churchill to St. Joseph, Father to Jesus, to the Birdman of Alcatraz, bringing out little-known aspects of how they managed to find freedom for themselves and connected to Source Within. Marge takes us on a journey of realization of what she has discovered are the foundations to the most important aspects of living a life that is full of meaning through service itself, which is the title of her new ebook, Marge Clamp, Her Spiritual Journey Through Service, which is now available on Amazon. A member of Ekinkar for over 40 years, Marge is a veteran of this contemporary spiritual movement and worked alongside Paul Twitchell in its early days. Paul Twitchell, the modern-day founder of Ekinkar, brought out the original teachings and writings in 1965 after decades of research and experiences with spiritual masters who deeply influenced him to recognize and accept his life mission to introduce Western culture to the ancient science of soul travel and take on the role of the Mahanta, the Living Ek Master, which is the spiritual leader of the Ekinkar organization. Ekinkar is a Sanskrit term that translates to mean co-worker with God, which is commonly shortened by members of Ekinkar to simply E-C-K or Ek, which translates from Sanskrit to mean Source or Holy Spirit. Marge was also the first wife of the current leader of Ekinkar, Sri Harold Klemp, known to members of Ekinkar as the current Mahanta, Living Ek Master. Traveling the world continuously for over 30 years on behalf of Ekinkar during its early phases of international growth, Marge brings a lifetime of experience to her writings and observations. She now lives in Colorado, where she continues to do research, writing and presentations, and enjoys being near her family. So, without further ado, Omni Art Salon proudly presents Searching for Freedom with Marge Clamp. Marge, it's so good to have you back on the Omni Art Salon. Well, a good morning, Jeffrey. It's nice to be back on Salon. Well, I, I know this that you've been pretty busy. Yeah, it's been a lot of things going on in this year, and I'm sure for you as well, as well as all over the world. But we're really interested. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's some really interesting things going on. Uh, I'm watching this whole thing with the. Uh, uh, disappearances of plane in Malaysia, and that that is all of that is extremely strange. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I think they they haven't uh, looked in the right places because um, I I'm betting that they're going to find this uh, the the plane somewhere. When on the, in the land, and because you know, uh, <clears throat> what a lot of people don't know in this country is that there is a lot of jungle in that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of very remote areas, 
And uh, I have a feeling it may have, it just may have gone down in the jungle, or like what they are saying now is that maybe it landed on one of the uh, uh, those remote islands out there. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's been interesting yeah. to watch that. It's also been interesting to watch what's going on in Crimea and in Ukraine. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think what they have to do is they just have to honor the folks that come through on Sunday in the Crimea. This is what we have to do. And the bottom line <laughs> with all of this, uh, 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 these uprisings and stuff, uh, Jeffrey, is... People want to be free. Right. They, they, they're, they're searching so hard for, for freedom. And, you know, you can search and search for that out here. And you're not going to find, you're not going to find a lot of it. Not even here in the U.S., actually, because even in the U.S., we have a lot of curtailments in our freedom. Right. And, and, and you know, of course, uh, I, uh, I certainly appreciate living in the United States. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've traveled all over the world, and every time I'd come home, like I'd land in New York or I'd land in Chicago or, or, or uh, Detroit or <clears throat> Minneapolis, the <clears throat> first thing I do when I get off the plane is almost bend down and kiss the ground. Yeah, and, uh, and then... But then what I'd do is I'd run off and get a I get a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, because yeah, because in a lot of places, well, they don't have them, <laughs> and, and either if they do have them, they're not as good as they are here. Do you also go uh, to a baseball game and have some apple pie? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I don't go to a baseball game, but. I'll tell you, I sure appreciate living in this country. <laughs> I really do. And uh, right now I'm visiting with my uh, brother and his, my sister-in-law in Las Vegas. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I'm grateful that I live in Colorado because where I live up there is... Um, they do such a good job in Colorado. I mean... Uh, and I'm living, uh, right now I'm staying out here on Black Mountain. And if anybody has been to Las Vegas and, and is familiar with this area, they know where Black Mountain is. And it's out in the Bundo. And I live in a state where every time you turn around, if there was a park or there's a, a, a light rail system, a light rail station, or some a uh, really good mode of transportation, and they don't have it here. The only place they have it is in uh, uh, downtown Las Vegas. Right. And yeah, and they really service that, and they service like Reno and some of the other areas where the money comes in, and it's lining the pockets of the great big um, casino owners. Right. And they don't care about the people in the outlying areas. Yeah, it's not known as a community-oriented place. It's a business place, Las Vegas. It is, it is a, a strictly a business place. And they don't care about the people who actually live and work here. Mm. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, and, you know that, is, that is all. That's really sad. That's really too bad. But that's the way it is here. I'm going home on uh, Wednesday, and I'm going to be glad to get back in Colorado, where I can get around. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah. you have a new book, and I yeah. wanted I wanted to bring up the book because it kind of ties into what you said earlier about freedom. And there's a lot of information yeah. in the book about freedom and also about service. Tell me what inspired you to write the book. Well. I'll tell you, uh, one of the people that really uh, encouraged me was just a, certainly the person who uh, did a lot of the writing and and uh, also uh, uh, did a lot of the editing, and that was uh, Patricia Ann Durande. And I think I've done an interview with her, and she is um, she's a real good friend of mine. 
and, and when I was living in San Diego, she asked me if we could sit down and work on the book. And so she would come over every Thursday afternoon and uh, interview me. And this book is uh, based on that series of interviews and also on a series of um, talks that I have given around the world. And so uh, there are about five or, five or six main um, uh, talks that we found that we, we liked, that we really thought that we could include in the book. And uh, we put, we published it online, Jeffrey, uh, rather than going to a regular publisher or going through through Eckenbart and uh, that's the, the spiritual teaching that we work with. And uh, the reason we did that was that so people like people in Africa could afford it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it would be readily accessible to them. And uh, uh, we we need more people in the world to be willing to be wonderful, open vehicles for the spirit. Uh-huh. The spirit, so you can call it spirit. We in Africa we call it the light and the sound of God. And what we make an honest attempt to do is to be vehicles um, that, that uh, where we can help as a vehicle for this <coughs> wonderful power, wonderful essence that comes through, that we're able to help others and be there for other people. And to encourage other others in their, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, right now, um, well, a lot of people that are looking into spiritual things right now are, are uh, finding that they're, they're able to they're able to work with that, and uh, that's uh, due to do, uh, their willingness. To being vehicles to to uh, and, and uh, we need we need more people to do that. How in your book have you uh, uh, tied that in about serving the light and the sound? Well, I'll tell you the whole idea of getting in of working on this book and working with the public is to encourage others uh-huh. to to be to be open vehicles to be be there. And accept what God uh, sends back through us, and uh, this is the reason we we worked on the book, and uh, and it's to encourage people to do that, and uh, it's doing okay. It's doing okay. If people really want to look at it, if any of your listeners want to take a look at it. You can go on Amazon.com, the book section or wherever, and put in my name, put in Marjorie Quinn, and it'll come right up and you can download it. Great. Well, one of the things you talked about in your book was about a hidden meaning behind life events. And I I find that an interesting concept, uh, an important piece of understanding our lives. Can you uh, elaborate on what that means to you a little bit? It's kind of like the, the, ba- the back story behind the, the, the front story of our lives. Uh, what do you th- I mean, you've lived quite a long time and you've, you've been in Eckenkar for many years. How does that work for you? Well, uh, it works uh, really wonderfully because I, I make a point of getting up and doing my spiritual exercises every day. And people need to do that. I don't care what religion they're in or what teaching they're following. They need to get up and they need to do their practices every day. You know, we're finding a lot of that encouragement. uh, What I'm noticing is that uh, there's some really quite remarkable people uh, emerging. And what this helps you do when you do do your spiritual practices every day, is you are a vehicle as you go about, in other words, you're a vehicle for, for God, mm-hmm. for, for the essence of 
on. And as you go about your work every day, as you go about uh, shopping and working with the clerks in the stores, and, and you're there uh, meeting people. And, you know, I'm, I'm here, I have a, my sister-in-law works for uh, United Healthcare here in Nevada. And she is the most wonderful person. I'll tell you, she just gives so much of herself to others and who other other people who really and truly need assistance. And if you, I go shopping with her, if she sees somebody struggling in one of the aisles, you know, and is having a hard time getting, you know, uh, getting something down off the shelf, she's right down there helping them. And uh, this is the way she is. And I've been really fortunate in having a um, really uh, remarkable family. My, I was raised a Mormon, I was raised LDS, so it was, an, it was a step towards the ethnic teachings because in the Mormon church they believe in other, other states of consciousness, they believe in other, other dimensions. And so when I started studying uh, the works of Paul Twitchell, it just all made so much sense to me. And um, one book I would recommend to anybody to read if they can uh, get hold of a, a, you know, a local Eckenkar Center where you can uh, uh, go online to eckenkar.org and order it from the, uh, web, on the website. And that is Eckenkar Key to the Secret World. Right. Because, yeah, because it gives a lot of really good basic uh, methods for anyone to use. And I mean, not just a uh, person who studies the Eckenkar works, but anybody can go through and uh, work with a lot of the techniques that is given, they're given in there, mm -hmm. and it will help them. It will not only help them in their lives, but it will help them in, in the lives of others. You've also done a lot of research in um, history, the history of spiritual giants and, and movements in history, the kind of the hidden meaning behind historical figures. Why, is that, why has that interested you so much? Well, it interests me because, um, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, historically, uh, there have been some real nasty people, but there have been some awfully good individuals, too. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you look, you, 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 people look at uh, what Julius Caesar did uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking the Romans into, uh, like, um, England and uh, north, even north of, as far north as Scotland. You know, and changing that their whole way of doing things up there, but he did it with force and with power. And there are those who have not done it. They they work uh, in other ways to to encourage people to uh, all of these to be better. Uh -huh. And uh, that, that's what I look at. I look at people. Who have, uh, who have worked with, uh, with mankind. There aren't a whole lot of them when you talk about it, you know. <laughs> uh, and, but they've been really important. And so, uh, and, and, and there's, there's some of them. Uh, I have a few of, there are a few individuals that I really appreciate a lot of the work that they did. Uh -huh. And one of them, surprisingly, is the, the figure of Joseph uh, that is depicted in the Hebrew Bible. And the reason that I uh, appreciate a lot of what he did is, is that he believed that God talked to him in his dreams. And there's some proof that he actually existed. A lot of stories in the Bible, you know, like what's coming out with this new, new movie, Manoa. You know, where is the movie on Gilgamesh? 
And we don't, I don't think he knows what Gilgamesh was, but he was uh, someone who lived several hundred years before Noah, and the story is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they think what, what a lot of scholars believe is that you know, the people who were writing, the, putting together the books of Genesis, that was um, the root under the, uh, who, who worked to his, uh, King David scribes, main scribes, and he helped put together a lot of the first book of the Bible. Well, they, they, they looked around, and they were looking at everything, and they thinking, what do we need here, you know? And so, if, if, if you went, if you went through, a lot of the different early books of you know, the uh, uh, Hebrew Bible or, or in some, some areas of, of these ancient teachings, he talked about um, people borrowing or plagiarizing. It would not stand up in today's world. Uh -huh. It really wouldn't. And so... But the reason I, was, I admire Digger uh, Joseph is that he believed that God spoke to him through his dreams. And that is really true. God does speak to us through our dreams. We do get a lot of good information. And we're finding that out these days. How, how do you see that? How do people understand uh, God through their dreams? Can you give us an example? Uh, you know, I've had some examples, but I can't think of a really good one right now. It's something that, uh, well, psychologists look at it and say, well, if some of the dreams that you have is what you're thinking about, what you're doing during the day, and so on and so forth. You know, some of that is true, but a lot of it isn't. I remember first having soul travel experiences, and then it's going out of the body or moving into another state of consciousness through my dreams. Uh -huh. And this is the way a lot of people experience it. They start experiencing very interesting, uh, you know, having very interesting experiences in their dreams. And sometimes you have a feeling like you're flying. Uh -huh. Or you're, and it's where you're actually moving into a different state of consciousness. But also, uh, you know, this has come down to where there is a kind of problem. You might have something prophetic in your dream. Like, for instance, I remember I had a dream that about driving down the street one day and having an accident. Oh, my goodness, you know. And it happened a few days later. But what happened was because I had that dream, my car was on one side of the, of the, of the, uh, the intersection. And one minute it was one place, and the next second it was on the other side. And I totally missed the accident. So it was a jump. <clears throat> yeah, it moved. It jumped. And, uh, you know, you look at that, you look at things like that, and then you look at the miracles that happen to you every single day. And uh, I was, I've been real fortunate in my life in having my mother who uh, really encouraged us to. Uh, look at our dreams and also encouraged us to get up in the morning and have spiritual conversations. And uh, that, we, that happened to all of us while we were growing up. And uh, so I've had, I've had it really, I've, had, I've been really lucky that way. Unfortunately, a lot of people haven't been. They've been terribly abused. Uh, Jeffrey, they've gone through living hell. Uh -huh. And uh, still, some of them have come out of it okay. 
they, they managed to move through it and come out the other side better people than they would have ever been otherwise. And so there is, what I want people to really realize, that there is really something something really good and wonderful taking place. If you want to get hooked into it, if you want to check it, if you want to start working with it, uh, it's there. And it's there for people to look with and use. And, but you know, it's the bottom line is that when you do that, there's the responsibility of giving of yourself. And that's the big lesson I had to learn in this lifetime. Yeah. Is to give of myself. And that's what was really one of the main reasons I wanted to, I agreed with Patricia to sit down and work on this book. And it's teaching people to give of themselves somehow. You know, to uh, be an open spiritual vehicle. Tell us a little bit how giving of yourself benefits you. Well, I'll tell you. I, I don't know uh, when I decided that, that the spiritual life was the way I wanted to go. That was the definite decision that I made. And it's so wonderful to see every day. I mean, because you see all of these little miracles happening in your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just one right after the other during, as you go about your day. And, or as, or as you, um, I've seen a lot of miracles in, in the amount of traveling that I've done. I mean, I, you don't know how close I've come to uh, being part of something like that in Malaysia Airlines, uh, coming very, uh, I mean, near, near crashing. And I've been able to uh, lean back in the seat and start working on a spiritual exercise and how things work out. Mm. You know, uh, it, it's, uh, and, and you, you you meet all kinds of wonderful people when you travel as much as I have. And uh, I remember once I met a man who was coming from Minneapolis and he was going back to France. And uh, he had been in Minneapolis. He was just received his uh, uh, ordination as a priest in the Catholic Church. And he was serving in France and he wanted to go home to Minneapolis so that his family could be present when he took his off. And while I was doing my spiritual exercises, he was doing his rosary in the seat next to me. Mm. You know, and uh, uh, we had the most wonderful conversation. When we got off the plane, he walked one way and I walked the other way. And he turned around and said, bless you. You know, and uh, you meet people like that who are really working hard in, in their own life to give of themselves. Uh, I suggest for any... Um, young Catholics listening to this broadcast to get uh, a book called um, Practicing the Presence of God. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was by a man named Brother Lawrence. And um, he worked in the kitchen at the, mon at the monastery where he was serving. And uh, he talks about how he saw God in everything that he did. And, you know, there have been some wonderful people that have done, done that. John Muir, the famous uh, um, person in the United States who actually saved a lot of our natural resources and was, was uh, the individual who was behind a lot of the different parks, Yosemite, uh, was one, uh, and uh, a lot of the different parks, Rocky Mountain National Park, we owe, our, we owe a lot to him. Uh -huh. 
do this is something that he did. He saw God in everything that he did. And that's the key, to see God in everything you do and see God in everything that you look at every day. It certainly expands your vision of life, doesn't it? Yes, and it enhances it. And, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time here. I know I'm getting, you know, I'm getting up there in years, and I really understand that. And you stop and think about it. We don't have a long time here. And we need to really work to uh, really give as much as we can. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that not only helps us here, or it helps others here. And it helps us when we move ahead. When, and now, uh, that can probably, we don't say, we use the word death. We say translation. Because that's really what we believe, that we translate into another state of consciousness. Uh-huh. And uh, so that helps. That helps when you do that, when you're able to do that. It helps them how much, you, how much you've been able to be an open vehicle. Do you find that the love of uh, the, the being an open vehicle and, and, and galvanizing in love makes you feel less fear and less um, concern about what's going to happen to you? Um, I'll tell you, no. It's not about a concern about what's happening to me. It's a concern about what's happening to somebody else. I see. And it, it's, always, it, it's always that way. Because, um, you know, you see, uh, what, uh, you see, I've seen so much, I've seen a lot of love in the world, but I've also seen a lot of love pain. Uh-huh. And, um, what, when I have to, when I have to visit uh, other places, like South America, like uh, some parts of Asia, where you see these little kids rifling garbage cans, you know, to find something to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I, all I could do was just send out all the love that I could to them because I couldn't pick them up and bring them home. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do that. <laughs> I wanted to pick them all up and bring them home, and I couldn't. And it's, uh, so you look at the, the work that Mother Teresa did in, um, in India. Uh, she worked with uh, people who really suffered. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, it was just, I was in a meeting once where somebody got up and said, well, you know, um, Mother Teresa wasn't sure she really believed in God or not. You know? <laughs> I know, right? I m- remember reading that. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, and I, I raised my hand and I stood up and I said, doesn't matter whether she believed in God or not. It doesn't matter. What she did was so good and so wonderful. You know? And she was just this really, really good kind of person. So people that um, they roll well, you know. So her work didn't matter. Yeah, it did. Because she was being a vehicle for whatever, and it didn't it didn't matter to her what that was. It was good and it was wonderful, and she wanted to give it out. She, she certainly did, and she and it's yeah. you know you've like you said earlier in the conversation you said there weren't that there aren't that many people in history that stand out as people who really made a difference and changed things from that spiritual point of view. Do you have any no. Do you have any uh, favorite ones that always come to mind when you think about uh, history historical figures? Yeah, um, one one person that. Was pretty close to my heart is Winston Churchill, and a lot of people don't know about his real spiritual side. 
he really had a spiritual side. He was, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities in the life of Winston Churchill and Adolf Hitler. A lot of people don't know that. Mm. They were both abused as children. You know, Hitler was more abused, but so was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had parents that were social gas lights, bottom line, and they just put their kids in, um, in, in boarding school and almost forgot about them. Uh-huh. The only person that he had that was really helpful to him was a, a nanny, with his nanny named Mrs. Forrester. And he had a picture of Mrs. Forrester on his desk until the day he died. But he had, he was, uh, he, he uh, when, when he was in school, he had a hard time learning. He was really slow when he was uh, in, uh, like, in grade school, uh-huh. early uh, middle school, what we call middle school. And he just wasn't getting it. And so the headmaster would take him down in the basement when he gets that great and beat the living daylight out of it. And what Winston Churchill said when he, all the time this guy was beating him out to death, was, I will not give up. I will not give up. And that's what he kept thinking. I will not give up. And he didn't. And what changed his life was when he started studying about the military. And something clicked in there when he started working with that, and his whole life opened up. And that's when he started to uh, do a lot of his self-education, and it's what uh, led him to be the Lord of the Admiralty during the Second World War, and I doubt, yeah, and I doubt if we would have won if we hadn't had him around. So he was set up to do that role. And, you know, and, uh, and, and eventually become Prime Minister of England. He was really, the uh, bottom line was he was a leader in the world. He could say he was Prime Minister of the world mm-hmm. when he was alive. And, uh, and so I studied quite a bit about his life, and but he he had mood swings, and you can understand that if they're being abused like that when you're gone, and that he had mood swings. Uh, he might have had a little bit of bipolar disorder mm-hmm. because he had mood swings, and he said what he did to get out of those mood swings. He took up art, started doing artist uh, works of art. And there are some of his works of art on the display at a museum in Texas. Oh. It's in Dallas, Texas. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, also, uh, another thing that he did was he, if you go, if you go to his estate, and I haven't been there, but I've seen a lot of pictures of it and I've read about it is that there are little walls built all over his estate. And that's what he used to do when he get in these moves to get himself out of it. He would build these little walls and then put plants, you know, plants, uh, flowers and stuff around it. Uh-huh. And he do a lot of uh, gardening and uh, he built these little walls. Uh, a year with his bed, he had so little and make up little brick walls all the way to state. And this is one of the three ways he did got him out of his mood swings. So he got into creativity. Yeah. Sounds like the creativity brought out his uh, upper... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he just pulled that creativity right from within himself. And that's where we have to look for those things, is not inside ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's where the freedom really is. It's within. It's within ourselves. You have um, people who have spent a lot of time on them. Um, but you read about the work of, you know, the life of the third man of Alcatraz. Now, he was not a nice, terribly nice person until he went to jail. <laughs> And and he then he started he started looking within himself, uh-huh. and he started to study birds. And we 
have um, a similar location on um, the birch uh, is some of the best scientific works they have on them. Amazing. And, yeah. And he built the wall. He had to go to jail. Mm-hmm. And it was where and jail was where they found his inner soul. It's almost like everyone's life is really programmed for them. It's really set up for them to learn what they need to learn and, and fulfill their personal mission. Do you see that way, too? Yes, yes. And, and this is what, what you, you need to do. But at the same time you're doing that, you need to give something out of yourself. Uh-huh. And I mean, it's really important to give something out of yourself. And the big power brokers in the long run in the long run, they're pretty much forgotten. Yeah, and it's people that are uh, that really give up themselves so remembered and remembered well. That's a that's a very important thing you just said. That the people who give of themselves are really remembered almost in the spiritual sense too, because their yes. their contribution is eternal. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right, and uh, people. Uh, Remember it? I mean, I remember. Uh, I, you know, I think that people certainly remember all the book and all of the things that Winston uh, Churchill did, and that uh, some of the incidents, and certainly remember about Mother Teresa. Uh-huh. And it doesn't matter what religion or what happened in this thing. They, they all came from um, people I've studied who come from uh, just a lot of different backgrounds. Uh-huh. They know, they, uh, you know, they, they haven't been just one religion. They haven't just been Catholic. Uh-huh. But what we're seeing today is really, uh, I mention this because there's so many people listening to broadcasts that are Catholic. And you need to really appreciate what Pope Francis is doing. Uh-huh. Because he is saying you need to get the people and you need to help the poor. You need to help those who are less fortunate than yourself. And he's really putting that message across. And uh, that's what, and it really, and truly, Jeffrey, that's wonderful. Well, that brings it back to your book, and your book is, what's the title of your book? It's about service, is it not? Yes, and uh, when, I was, when, I, when I was doing a lot of that traveling and everything, well, every place I went, I was the vehicle for the I declared myself a vehicle for the light and sound, and also the mission of the moment uh, we know the mind is a very extremely high state of consciousness in this world. And uh, people need to, uh, more people need to understand a little bit more about it. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, so in every part of the world, and uh, so that's what I did. And uh, I've seen so many I've seen so many miracles, and I've seen so many, so much. I've seen a lot of pain, but I've also seen a lot of miracles. And if you, if you wear yourself to see it, so that essence of the light and sound, the light and sound of God, and keep it there, you will see a lot of people every day. And sometimes they don't look like miracles. You know, and sometimes you, you see this, you see something, you see it, and nobody else around you does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and so basically the bottom line is really work to build your spiritual life because it's the only thing worth doing. I think that's that that says it all, doesn't it? Really, because it's the only thing that you carry with you wherever you go in this life or any other incarnation. That's right. That's right. Oh, well, and whatever you're doing here, you're building for um, the time after you leave. 
whether or not you decide to come back, you know. And if you do decide to come back, you bring that all that all that back with you. Mm. Yeah. Well, March. So, that was that was a, that's wonderful, and I, I just think that the uh, listeners will really appreciate your sharing your wisdom over the many years you've been involved in doing this. Um, where, where again? What's the name of your book so they can find it? It's Marjorie Flint's Spiritual Life and Spiritual Service. Ah. And if you like, you go to uh, Amazon.com. Uh, you, uh, I suggest Amazon because it's easier to download. You can also go on uh, uh, a couple of other websites, but usually um, Amazon is the easiest to, to download. And uh, just put in my name, Marjorie, M A R J O R I E, and it will open up. Great. And then you can, then you can download it. Wonderful. Well, Marge, thank you so much for uh, this conversation today. I look forward to, to future conversations. Yeah, I, I look forward to future conversations, too, and just kind of making a look at every once in a while. It's nice for us to sit back and take a look at what's going on in the world. Absolutely. And see, and let me see how we can, um, how we can facilitate it our work better and how we can help others more. Yes. Yes. Okay, well, hey, thanks a lot for calling, Jeffrey. I really appreciate it. I always love to talk to you, my friend. Uh, so I always love talking to you, too. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't know it, but Jeffrey and I worked together for a while. And so we've been friends a long time. <laughs> and we'll continue forward. <laughs> Nice to talk to you again, Jeffrey, and uh, good luck with your show. Thank you so much, Marge. Okay.